Hi, and welcome to the We Don't Have Time Dragonflies Den update. My name is Katarina Rolfstotter Jonsson, and I am a We Don't Have Time host. During the Stockholm Plus 50 broadcasts, we arranged a Dragonflies Den. And uh, that's where when companies were able to pitch their comet solutions to the audience. And today we bring you an update. And this is an intermediate between uh, Stockholm Plus 50 and COP27. And today, the contestants, the ones that directly qualified during Stock Office 50, will be able to present uh, their solutions more in depth. And during uh, the meeting in, in um, Sham el Sheikh, I almost said Glasgow, but that was COP26. Uh, during the meeting in uh, COP27 in Sham el Sheikh, Egypt, the, uh, these companies will be able to pitch again. And they will this time contest with other partners. So more companies will be pitching during COP27. And at COP27, we'll have a jury of climate communications experts, just like we had at Stockholm Plus 50. And uh, they will award points uh, based on how much the solutions that are presented benefit the climate. And uh, the winner will get a great prize. They will get a one year uh, proactive partnership with We Don't Have Time. And by getting that, they will be able to get support to get their solutions even more out into the world. And with this, it's my pleasure to introduce the three finalists from Stockholm Plus 50 that, will, that are directly qualified to the, uh, to the event in, in uh, Sham el Sheikh in COP27. With us, we have Andrew Sims, co-director from the New Weather Institute. We also have Eric Alström, who is founder uh, and CEO at Klogga. Welcome, warm welcome to both of you. And we have Yi Li, who is Vice President Growth at Terraformation. How are you all today? Doing good. Pretty good. It's been pouring with rain in South London, but apart from that, it's good. For sure. Uh, Excellent. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have one contestant from uh, here from Sweden, one from London, and one from the United States. And you are based, Ely, in Hawaii, correct? In Hawaii, where it's also been raining, although maybe more characteristic. <laughs> Well, we do see the effects of climate change already. We all know this. Mm. And the weather is more dramatic. So um, the vision, I'd like to start with the vision. I'd start, like to start with you, Eric. The vision for your solution, for the future of your solution. Would you like to start there? Well, uh, as, as you know, PLOGA stands for picking and jogging. It's a combination word. I will not really go into it, but it's more or less changing attitude. And we have to start with the children, of course. We have to become, they have to get, get more active. And as I normally do my presentation, I like people to stand up. And I see that uh, G and Andrew, and you are not really standing up, guys. I, I'll ask you to stand up while you're doing this presentation, because we are made to move. And unfortunately, we don't do that enough. So we had to let our kids start moving. And uh, our vision is uh, to have it as a subject in the schools and in the gymnastics. That's one of the ones, uh, a vision of that. And also having annual and national championship in plugging, both for grown-ups and for children. And then all races, all different events, and you will travel. You will travel with a purpose. You will not only go for a for a conference, you have to do something. You have to give back to nature. You have to give back to Mother Earth. You not, you can't only travel to one spot. The same with those events. Run, but run with a purpose. And uh, we like to have uh, plugger workouts. We had to have flash mobs. We had to annual races in different kind of cities. That's our vision for the future. And Eric, I think I jumped a little bit too ahead because I was so so eager to hear your vision. But maybe <laughs> not everybody heard about. The, the the foundation between the, the the idea behind Plogger. So I think I think you need to elaborate a little bit on that. Okay, sorry. Okay, I I start. I go I go a little bit. That's back. fine. I'm saying uh, Plogger. It's um, actually we talk about the five reasons why it's so important, and it becomes it's, it becomes one of the biggest global health and environment movements in the world right now, and um, it stands for as you know we're not really moving enough. And we we actually losing um, we losing control we losing uh, 
from our bodies and also because of mother nature. We spend too much time in front of our gadgets. So we had to make it fun. We had to get everybody moving. Uh, an average 14-year-old is spending about uh, about 9% nine, 9 of the 14-year-old is spending is moving enough. So that is number one. We had to move more. Number two, we, it's going to be more plastic in the oceans at 2050 if we don't plug it up. So it's, that's a big problem. And we're killing the wildlife, as you well are aware of. And then it costs so much money that someone is, has to pick up the litter. And then the last one is we call this the broken window theory. And that means you know, in a clean environment, we trust each other. We're not hostile. So that's a plug up high five. And that's the one we succeed in having five years spreading all around the world. It's amazing what you've done, Eric. And, and uh, the name Plogga is based on the, the Swedish word Plocka, which means pick, and yoga, which is, is jogging and running, correct? But now it's an internationally used word. Yes, it's become, uh, it's, it's actually one of the, it's a new word in England, in Holland, in Denmark, Norway, Finland. It's, if you Google it, I think you get about two and a half million hits or so. So it's um, especially the, the word plugging is the one of the international words. So it's uh, it's I will tell you a little bit more how it's been spreading through countries like India, where it's one of the biggest health health trends like now. The world world record is 146,000 people was plugging at the same date in India. <laughs> yes, I, I got goosebumps. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, thank you, Eric. So Andrew, uh, the New Weather Institute, tell the, tell the audience about the New Weather Institute and also about your visions for your solution, please. I will, and I'm gonna say to Eric, what a wonderful idea his is. And just to defend my own level of activity over the weekend, I got a 12 mile run in and I got a 50 mile bike ride in. So I'm doing my bit to get as active as possible, trying to model the change on environmentally friendly forms of transport, i.e. my feet and a bicycle. Um, so the New Weather Institute is a think tank, we're an environmental think tank, but the thing that I'm here to talk about is one of our campaigns, and that's the Badvertising campaign. And the Badvertising campaign is about stopping adverts from fueling the climate emergency. I think many of us will remember the bad old days when you used to see even doctors advertising cigarettes. We realised that was a bad idea. It was normalising something that was incredibly bad for our health. And today, it will be unthinkable to have tobacco adverts, cigarette adverts. But in the teeth of the climate emergency and the emergency, the ecological emergency of overconsumption that's pushing us over planetary boundaries, we're surrounded by adverts that encourage high carbon lifestyles and overconsumption. Um, we wonder why this rate of change drags behind what the science says is necessary. And that's because sometimes in economics, the price locks in old ways of doing things. Sometimes the infrastructure locks in old fossil fuel heavy ways of doing things. But advertising is locking in high carbon behavior. So what we want is a world where advertising is no longer fueling the climate emergency and pushing us over those planetary boundaries. We want to see some sort of pretty easy steps taken by local government and national government. So we have tobacco style restrictions on adverts for high carbon goods and lifestyles. We want to reduce the amount of advertising that we're exposed to because we know we've got a lot of research now that tells us how bad it is for our mental health and our well-being as well quite apart from encouraging these sort of damaging behaviours. Now, I live in London. If you walk around in London sometimes now, you can be surrounded 360 degrees by adverts for airlines. There's digital adverts, there's fixed adverts. You're sort of immersed in this thing which is normalising high carbon behaviour. So we want a culture which is different in our towns and cities, where we can choose not to have to sort of digest all these images and where we have active sort of cultures replacing the encouragement for just passive consumption that is pushing us in the wrong direction. So that's our vision. We call it the advertising campaign. And increasingly, there are things happening. There are cities throughout Europe that are beginning to introduce rules on this of this nature. In France, they're looking at restrictions on advertising for airlines and for cars. And we're, we're seeing the push at the European level to have something like a regulation introduced, just like what they used to stop 
adverts for tobacco. So that's our vision. We want a world free of the kind of advertising that's pushing us over the climate cliff and cities and towns with, with a more healthy and attractive environment where we're not constantly bombarded with advertising, especially for high carbon goods. Excellent. It's a beautiful, beautiful concept. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, Yili, Terraformation, for those that are not familiar with Terraformation and also uh, your vision, please. Yeah. So Terraformation's mission is to plant uh, and grow uh, 3 billion net new acres of forests around the world. Um, this is equivalent to the trillion tree number that, that uh, some of you may have heard uh, talked about in, in, in press and public. Um, so yeah, 3 billion acres, that's a lot of new forests. That's equivalent to, uh, for those that are familiar with uh, North American geography, that's the, the 48 contiguous United States plus Mexico. So it's a very, very large uh, land surface area. Good news is that the planet has more than enough uh, acreage available. There, there's many billions of reforestable, high potential uh, uh, forest land that, that, that's available that's now degraded and doesn't have trees and we can replant it. Um, but the one thing that's, that's screamingly obvious about our mission, um, and, and this really informs our, our vision for what the future, uh, economy and society can be like, uh, the one thing that's screamingly obvious is no single company, no single country, no single group of people is going to be able to accomplish this by itself. So our vision for the future is really about, uh, creating an entire new generation, uh, that really uh, views forests as a, a valued part of their lives, as part of their livelihoods, as part of society, and, and value standing trees as a, a key part of how they go about their, their daily lives. And so um, all of the tactics that we put together to, to try to achieve this mission and vision are really about empowering new teams, new forestry teams, um, educating people about forestry livelihoods, um, and equipping and training new teams of people uh, to be able to go tackle this challenge all collectively as a, as a movement. And we hope that at the end of this, um, humanity overall will have gained this new confidence that, oh, we together collectively can actually shape the surface of the planet um, and we can see the results uh, in, a, in, a, in a single human lifetime and to do it proactively in a, in a conscious way, as opposed to the sort of conscious advertising or, or, or leaving plastics everywhere for ploggers to pick up, right? That we can actually be more conscious uh, about how we shape, collectively shape our planet. Thank you, Yuli. You can just feel it in, in your body when you say this, uh, when, you, when, you, when you talk about this vision, it, it feels, feels beautiful and, 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 and wonderful uh, within the, the, the entire system. Um, I know you also work with, with seed banks. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that, please? Yeah, sure. So um, one of the key things that we have realized uh, is in order to create new successful forestry teams and to, to arm them, right, to equip them and train them to be successful as carbon foresters or carbon sequestration um, uh, uh, foresters, uh, is you have to tackle the bottlenecks that stand in their way, right? There's many things that make forestry hard. Um, and so terraformation, and we hope many, many, efforts like ours will make forestry easier. Um, and one of the key bottlenecks is just lack of seeds, right? If you're trying to plant 3 billion acres of net new forest, it can't all just be one species. We can't just carpet bomb the world with, with eucalyptus or, some, or bamboo or some other fast growing species, right? If you're trying to cover the world with that much forestry, it needs to be native, endemic, you know, biome appropriate uh, forests. And that means if you're trying to plant a trillion native or endemic tree species, then you need to have multiple trillions of seeds available to be able to germinate and then go plant that many trees. And so um, seed supply is a, is a major bottleneck. Um, and one of the things that Terraformation has offered to the world is this idea of an off-grid solar powered uh, seed bank that, that can be built uh, or delivered anywhere in the world and be able to operate uh, as a, as a, as a, a, a a project specific, a, a forest, like a working seed bank, um, which is a pretty different vision, actually, than 
this idea of like a giant monolithic seed bank that's above the Arctic Circle and saves, mm -hmm. you know, agricultural seeds for like apocalyptic scenarios and things like that. Right. And it was flooded. The, the, it was flooded, right. actually. And it was <laughs> flooded. Ah, oh, you're right. Mm -hmm. But like, so, so no, we're not talking about that kind of like big monolithic seed bank. We're talking about lots and lots of hundreds of thousands of working seed banks that each store a few million seeds and are distributed all around the world at the sites where forestry needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And really what you're doing there is just seasonal seed collection. You're, you're just banking up enough seeds to germinate in the nursery, ideally right next to the seed bank for that next planting season and really rotating seeds and, and, and seedlings through it. Um, and that style of seed supply is really what the world needs to like amplify and propagate uh, enough trees to be able to go plant uh, the, the number of trees we need. Excellent. So this is all about scaling. And Eric, it's also about scaling for you, right? To make sure that more people blog. Um, what, what, is, what, do you, what stands in your way for, for creating this vision, for, for making it happen to get even more people to blog? Well, uh, that's what Yi Lee said. It's just, um, we have to be, actually, we have to be out in the forest more. We have to be out in nature. We have to get connected. We have to go around bare feet. We mm -hmm. can't st spend all this time in, in our cities because we're not born in the cities. We are not born to work on these hard surfaces. So we have to, we have to, have to hug a tree more often. And uh, that's not really the, the way our youth are doing it. So our, the re how, we could, how we could change this, it's just we had to have a platform. We had to connect all those million ploggers in the world. We had to have a technical one. So you had to see who is a plugger. A lot of the pluggers feel alone. They don't feel connected. We also have to have measure how much have we been plugging, how much, much CO2 have we saved the world by plugging it instead of it. Uh, it's instead of all the garbage will will land in the oceans. And right now, we the during the world championship in Italy, we're gonna all the all, how far we've been running. We will also see how much trash we've been, pick, we've been picking up and then we will see how much CO2 have you really saved instead of it's going to lay on the streets or going to land in the oceans. So that is, we had to have, uh, we had to have more people. I'm more or less by myself. And um, so that's a technical platform to connect everyone for sure. And the measurement, we had to see how much have you really picked up and how far have you been running? How far did Andrew really been cycling? Is that for sure or is it not? Uh, and how much uh, trash was he picking when he was doing the running yeah. there? How much were you, Andrew? <laughs> so you, you, what you're implying here is that we need to be able to measure and connect and also validate uh, what's happening, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So over to Andrew. You can answer Eric's question first and then mine. That's fine. <laughs> Well, I can tell you what I did do. So, how much did you pick any trash? I can, I can tell you what I did pick up, which, 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 which Yi Li may, 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 be, may be happy with. I live just on the edge of um, one of London's many big, big green spaces. And right now in London, all the oak trees and the horse chestnut trees are dropping acorns and conkers all over the place. And I've got here one of the conkers that I picked up when I went for my run around the common just the other day. So, if you want Yi Li, I'm going to, I will collect up a two big bags for them and hopefully we can get a seed bank in south london for um our own native species um <laughs> uh, so i do try i do try i do try um in terms of where we're at i suppose we face quite a large problem in the 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 obstacle that we face is is the model of business as usual the economic model we have at the moment that prioritizes especially in already relatively wealthy countries um, growth at all costs. It confuses us consuming more with us leading better lives. All the old things that we've known are not true for many, many years. Well, over 50 years ago, when Bobby Kennedy gave his speech, saying that growth measures everything apart from that which is truly useful and valuable in life. And I think the idea that we um, allow ourselves and we allow our public domains, our streets and our travel networks to become um, galleries for consumerism and overconsumption is one of our big problems. We've, we've lost a respect for our public domain and, and the quality of our public domain. And I think that's something that we have to get across. And we need to recognize that 
um, when you get beyond a certain level of income in a society, you need more mature goals. You need to set out to increase your your well-being and the ability of your economy to operate within the limits of the biosphere, genuine prosperity and well-being. And one of the other problems, of course, is that advertising not only advertises the products which are pushing us beyond those ecological limits, it normalizes that behavior, but it also normalizes itself to the point where there's so much of it that it becomes weirdly invisible. And even if we think we're aware of it, they're so clever at getting under your radar, getting sort of under your skin. So it's a big problem. But once you start seeing it, you see it everywhere. And in terms of the particular climate crisis, you can see how effective it's been by looking at one single product. If you look at sports utility vehicles, which not much more than a decade ago represented only about one in 10 of new cars bought. And then after intensive marketing and advertising for a decade, they now represent well over four in 10 of all new cars bought. And the latest data on global greenhouse gas emission trends shows that SUVs have been, have been the second biggest cause of the areas where we're still increasing emissions. So it's a very direct impact on normalizing new patterns of behavior. Just as we've had the technology to travel more in, in more environmentally friendly ways, people have been buying bigger, more aggressive cars that are more energy intensive because they're surrounded by adverts for them. And sometimes it's really crazy. You go to a train station and people are acting against even their own self-interest because in the train station, you'll see adverts for their competitor transport modes like airlines. Um, so, you know, acting against their own interests. So getting people to see the scale of the problem around them and acknowledge it, I think is one of the big problems, but also acknowledging that we need new economic directions if we are going to survive as a species. And we need a new economic model that doesn't prioritize consumption above everything else. Thank you very much, Andrew. Indeed. Um, Yuli, what challenges are you facing to reach your vision? Yeah, so there are some key bottlenecks that, that I started to describe, seed supply being one of them. Um, uh, stage Early stage forestry financing uh, is another key bottleneck that the world is facing that Terraformation is, is working on. Um, a third bottleneck is uh, the just the current state of carbon markets and carbon tracking. It's quite difficult, right, to run uh, a carbon sequestration uh, project. There's uh, very often uh, like quite uh, a delay, right, from the start of the project until you're able to actually provably, uh, at least by current standards, start to you know sequester carbon and create very quote unquote verified carbon credits. So that whole system needs to be accelerated. Um, but, but really, the most fundamental uh, bottleneck or the most fundamental uh, capacity issue, I, I think, is just the number of people, the number of forestry teams that are operating in the world today. Uh, we actually talk with pretty much all of the top tree planting organizations in the world. They're, they're our partners. Uh, we supply them with equipment and training. So these are organizations like TIST and Eden and We Forest and Global Forest Generation and reforest action. And there's, there's, uh, you know, a, around a half dozen, maybe six or seven organizations in the world today that plant new trees that, that do afforestation projects at sort of million tree or greater per year kind of scale. Um, and that's, that's an issue, right? The fact that there's only six or seven, uh, the, again, a trillion trees, that's such a huge number, 3 billion acres. It's such a large project for, for humanity to, to undertake. We can't have just our fates resting in the in the hands of six or seven organizations. We need 600, 6,000 uh, forestry organizations out there operating. And so a big, big challenge for us is figuring out how to incentivize and start that many new forestry teams. Um, and that's why everything you see on our, on, our, on our website and all of our, our, our public information, it's really about encouraging people to start new forestry teams and get new forestry projects started. So, Yili, in order in order for you to 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 uh, to surpass these challenges, what do you need? I, I know it's always money, but everybody <laughs> needs more money. Yeah. But, but apart well, from apart from funds, what do you need? Yeah. Well, the crazy thing to me is that there 
it's not like we have a shortage of people. <laughs> we have seven, you know, over seven and a half billion people on the face of the planet. We have more than enough land, right? We've got enough trees. We've had, like we talk about a trillion trees like it's a big number, but there's actually three to four trillion trees already existing on the planet, right? So all of the natural resources that we need, including like the financial resources, are there, right? You see all these announcements of you know billions of dollars committed to green bonds and 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 new carbon funds and things like this, and you know corporate. Um, uh, net zero or carbon neutral pledges happening all the time, which is amazing. I love seeing all this progress. So I, I don't actually think that the world lacks for the, the the material or the people or the resources to be able to actually pull this off. This is definitely within human capacity, within our societal human capacity to do this. It's a question of alignment. And that's actually the thing that, that, that I think Terraformation is trying to demonstrate more than anything else. It's like, there is a model, there is an economic model, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a model of commercial activity that is compatible with carbon sequestration and environmental interests. And it's possible to be both economically good for local communities, as well as environmentally good for the planet. Um, and to align these interests in a way where the folks who do have money are able to put this, put their money to work in supporting these efforts and, and be able for, you know, for this entire, you, you can think of it as a business ecosystem, right? You're trying to create a business ecosystem at the si same time as you're trying to create a forest ecosystem. If you can get these two ecosystems working in concert, right, aligned, then then the whole thing starts to turn. So that's really, I think, the the, the challenge that, that Terraformation works on is aligning incentives. So you're like a conductor. <laughs> an you accelerator. To... Yeah, an accelerator like, is is, yeah. is what we would say. Yeah. And, and if you think about what accelerators do, if you th in, in a business context, there's many folks, you know, watching, you've probably heard of like startup boot camps or like startup accelerators that, that are operating in your local city, right? Or at your university, right? There's this, this, this term, this idea of like a startup uh, boot camp or a startup accelerator has become pretty common, common these days, right? Mm -hmm. And we, th we don't even blink our eye at it because, yeah, sure, a startup is just an early stage business and an accelerator is this like facility that's going to give a little bit of investment. It's going to give a little bit of aid and advice. It's going to introduce these early stage companies to like new business partners and, and help them progress, right, as a business and, and, and make progress. Uh, so the same sort of concept really should apply to forestry teams, right? There should be forestry incubators and accelerators that take in new forestry teams, give them a little bit of investment, give them a little bit of equipment and training and help them progress on their journey to become a successful carbon forestry team mm -hmm. and help them graduate, right? To become the the the, the next uh, amongst the six or seven or 600 or 6,000 great forestry companies in, in the world. And that's uh, great forestry communities in the world. That's really, I, I think, the, the, the thing that, that Terraformation has been unlocking. Thank you, Healy. Andrew, over to you again. Uh, in terms of what you need to speed up the, the reaching of your vision? I think there's a number of things, actually. The great thing is that we're starting to see action at the local authority level, at the town and city level. Very often cities are going ahead of what national governments are doing. And I think we want to see more leadership from progressive local and city councils where they can take the experience of other areas where, for example, in a lot of cities now, you won't have advertising near school gates because we know it's not good to expose children to advertising. We're seeing a number of um, Dutch councils. We're seeing councils in the UK. We saw Sydney um, just this summer introduced a policy to stop um, fossil fuel companies advertising. So I think cities can move quickly and we'd like to see a lot more of them leading and showing national governments what is possible. And then we think the national governments will come along too. I think the other thing is we need people to become a lot more conscious of the impact of advertising. As I said, it's become so normalized. There's so much of it that we tend to tune it out and forget the effect that it's having on us, but we know how clever they are. And we know that the techniques that advertisers use and their ability to get at you across every platform and join up all the dots, that they are extremely influential, even when we're not aware of it over our own behavior. So I think we need to kind of, to use the jargon, take away that sort of social license to operate that they have. I think there's also a big opportunity for people who work in the massive creative industries around advertising as well. Much as back in the day when tobacco advertising became a, an issue, a lot of 
more ethically driven and very conscious people working in the industry said, no, we don't want to work on those briefs anymore. We're going to drop the briefs. Um, I think it will be really nice as we look forward to the COP, um, COP27, to hear delegates calling for a ban on high carbon goods. Because what are we trying to, you know, what's going on if we're all desperately trying to kind of cut our emissions and yet we're being surrounded by adverts that are calling for us to fly more and drive more and do high carbon activities. And then I think there's also a big role in which the media can take a lead. And I think this will be another lesson that we take from how we got rid of a lot of tobacco advertising when some newspapers, one or two newspapers have already introduced policies about not taking adverts from fossil fuel companies. Some are going further and considering airlines and, and cars as well. So I think there's lots of things that can happen. Leadership is what we're calling for. A bit of courage, learning the lesson of history, knowing there's a precedent and knowing all the benefits that will flow from it and knowing that we'll feel better as a result if we're surrounded by less advertising and it will be easier to achieve our climate objectives at the same time. Thank you again, Andrew. That's uh, very well put. And it'll be it will be easier as a, as a human being to navigate in this because it's, it's the temptations are always surrounding us and it's not easy to always withstand them, is it? It's like getting mixed messages, isn't it? How often have we heard that? That we, I was just sort of thinking it's, it's those sort of crazy mixed messages that we get when politicians, you know, everyone's saying we've got to tackle the climate, blah, 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 blah. And then all around we get these other messages saying, no, don't worry about that. Keep flying, keep driving, keep consuming. So I think if we can get rid of some of those mixed messages, yes, I think you're absolutely right. It'll make it much easier for us as individuals to make the changes that we need to make. Absolutely. Eric, uh, from your perspective, what does Plogam need to succeed? In even more than you have already? Well, first of all, it's just the stigma, more or less, and that's changing the attitude. I mean, if all of us just bend down and start picking up the litter you, that you see in front of you, well, you, you get more exercise when you're bending down in, as normal walking. And then the, the person behind you will see that. So, in a way, everybody. Everybody should be a plugger because I can tell you the whole, then we're not talking about global warming and, and over consuming and stuff. It's such an easy activity and it's, it's just a stigma. And the, if we're starting with the kids, because once, once they are, they love to have these treasure hunts because plugger is a, it's a fun way. We don't show the index fingers. We are not activists. We are more like um, the Greenpeace or the World Wildlife Foundation, but we are both working for the, the, the physical and the environment reasons. So it's such an easy activity. Excellent. Uh, wonderful to listen to all three of you. Uh, do you have any comments or reflections to, to, to finish off any call to action or, or maybe comments on, on each other's presentations? You are, you are contestants. I mean, one of you wants to win and you will have more more partners pitching in in in, uh, in Egypt, but you are also teammates in in Team Planet. So, what would yeah, you I'm, like to I, say? I don't I don't think we're in co competition. I want everybody to win. I want everybody to win. You're all so wonderful. The the future is the future will be full of forests if we're going to have a future. The future will be full of much less plastic waste if we're going to have a future. So, I I I, I think that we're all in it together. I I definitely feel like teammates. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. Well said. Well, um, we'll see you again. Next time we'll meet, we'll be uh, online or physically, uh, maybe in, in, in Egypt. And um, best of luck until then. And just keep at it. You're doing wonderful work. Absolutely. And it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lovely to meet you.